the thing about graffiti as I practiced it, you know, the bigger the better, right? So the reason why I did this scale of canvases is because we would spray paint the panel on a subway. To get any smaller than this, I wouldn't be able to use straight spray paint. So I wanted to keep it authentic. These are all things I could have painted on a train or a wall. The bigger the better. So to see it projected across like three buildings, <laughs> yeah, incredible. So I just do what makes me happy. There's a lot of joy in these things. There's a lot of pleasure in these things. I have a ball painting. It's the same shit I loved when I was a kid. I'm fortunate to still be doing it now. If somebody else sees it and they feel some of that same passion and joy, great. If they don't get it at all, oh well. I'm Keo X-Men and I'm a graffiti artist, a graffiti writer from Brooklyn, New York. And I've done many things, graphic arts, commercial arts, been involved in music and around the culture, but um, graffiti has always been a part of it. You know? As a very, very young child, you know, I wanted to fit in and find my niche, like most kids. I wanted to belong. And uh, my neighborhood was kind of tough and I didn't really fit in. I was sort of a nerdy, you know, I wasn't a tough guy. And I wasn't good at sports and I wasn't athletic and I couldn't dance and I wasn't good with the girls, but I could draw. And that wasn't really that cool. But then when I realized that there were graffiti artists, I became aware that these guys were creating, but they were also respected in the streets. They had a mystique about them. They were, you know, to my young mind, they were like superheroes. They had a secret identity. People talked about their work without knowing who they were. It's like you'd wake up the next morning and something would be painted in the neighborhood. You come to school in the morning and the handball court has a new piece on it and all the kids are talking about it. Whoa, you know? and the names that you would hear. It just, it grabbed me and I knew that that's what I wanted to be. Even before I was able to actually do it, in my mind, I, I was that already, you know what I mean? This is a big boy, somebody wanna give me a hand? And I'm supposed to remember to do this on every signature, but I don't. That actually is legally binding. I have my name, my signature copywritten, so anytime I just draw that, okay. it's applicable for whatever small amount of protection that'll give you. When you write graffiti, your name like is your sig artwork. Yeah, your signature true. is your artwork. That's true. So to put another signature on the back, it's redundant, but it, if it makes it official for the art buyers and the provenance or whatever, the, you know, so they know it's legitimate, whatever, that's a small thing to add. Yeah, this one could use a signature. about Storm, does she have a signature? All right. Oh yeah, I took good care of her. You want something on the back in addition to the 79? Makes it more official.
This particular exhibition, first of all, it's a far larger scale undertaking than anything I've done in the fine art world. That it's happening here in London is pretty incredible to me. You know, I never would have imagined that I would uh, be <laughs> debuting in Europe, you know what I mean? Where we're going next with it, you know, maybe uh, Dubai, China, you know, I really feel like there's a world of possibilities opening up and this is the beginning of something much larger. This is really only uh, a preview of coming attractions, you know? So we'll be here through December 20th at the Love Watts Art Space in uh, lovely Mayfair, London. And um, I'm hoping you all can come through and check it out. Peace. The cool thing is I have no idea what to expect. I've done little shows in, in Manhattan before. I've done, you know, been part of a small group show or whatever, but I've never had the machine behind this, you know, with Love Watts and all these folks promoting it. I don't know who's going to walk through that door. I don't know what the vibe will be like, and I'm excited, you know, like a kid on Christmas Eve, like, it, you know. It's cool that I can still feel that way uh, about things, you know? I'm not jaded, I'm, I'm like, this is, this is exciting stuff for me, so, you know. I know you visited Woodbury House twice. Yeah. First time in our former location, Soho, and the second time being here. What was your first initial impressions about Woodbury House and coming to our new establishment? Well, you guys have always taken great care of me and um, I appreciate you. But this new facility, Sackville Street, is amazing because uh, all the light, the skylights and, you know, it really is uh, more conducive to, to showing large artworks. And this is, you know, Mayfair, it's like the prime strip for galleries. So I couldn't ask for any better. So rewinding the clock slightly, I think it was almost 18 months ago, two years ago, we was on a quest to do some content 
mostly about the artists that we promoted initially, a guy called Richard Hambleton. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of dovetailed into more a wider piece about street art and the origins of it, which is, you know, the 70s and 80s in, in New York, graffiti, subway bombing, that turned into street art. And now it's a big movement within auction houses, big galleries worldwide, and, and also museums. And our friend, Nemo Labrizzi, Nemo who features Labrizzi, good man. on the Shadow Man documentary, he said, if you're over, you've got to be connected to Keo because this man was in the monks all the greats. And when we started doing our research, it's, uh, it's clear to see that you were in that, that pot with all those big names. You showcased at the Fun Gallery at 16 years of age with Basquiat, Haring, Dondi White, Futura, Ramos, etc. And you saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. What was New York like back then in the 70s and 80s? Well, you know, um, it was a lot more raw and things were kind of um, the wild, wild west, I would put it, because we didn't have any resources. So there were no real facilities for kids. We just uh, made the city our own. We used to hop the turnstile and, you know, shoplift whatever we needed. and. It just seemed like a free-for-all, but it was also a super creative time and there was a whole lot going on artistically, musically. I guess things go in cycles, but that was a creative period that people still look to for influence. And I had no idea when I was in the middle of it that 30, 40 years later, we'd still be talking about this stuff. We were just having fun. So I didn't think I was uh, any kind of maverick or pioneer, you know what I mean? I was just, just doing what my friends did and having a ball. So that I got to be around certain folks who are now legendary artists or, or game changers, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I didn't even realize who was who or what they would become. Like I was in a group show with 300 artists at the Fun Gallery called Graffiti Thanks A Lot. And some of those guys, their names have been forgotten over time. Other ones get 20 million for a canvas on auction. So you never know. How did the uh, whole fun gallery uh, show, how was you invited to that? The first graffiti gallery show that I attended was at the Mud Club and it was upstairs on like the fourth floor. Then the next one I went to was in the South Bronx at Fashion Moda. So there were only one or two spaces that would show real graffiti at that time. It wasn't like it is now, you know, uh, museums in, 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 in Wynwood and, and it was still sort of underground. So wherever it was, we would travel to it. You'd hear word of mouth, yo, Crash has a show here, Days has a show there. And we would head up to the Bronx to check that out. So once the fun gallery started, and they had two locations in the East Village, I started going to the first one, then they moved to, I think it was 11th Street. I was just hanging around there. So I came as a viewer, but the nature of graffiti back then is, you know, you'd bring your black book and people would sign it and you'd get to talking about graffiti. And so I began to hung, hang out there a lot and meet some of my heroes and um, exchange work with them. So once I got to meet Patty Astor, who ran the gallery, you know, she extended me an invite for a group show. And that's just how it went. You know, you were in the right place at the right time. And uh, again, it was a very small circle back then. And at the names I mentioned earlier, Basquiat, Keith Haring, Petura, Dondi White Ramosi, the only one by your good self that is still alive out of those names is Futura. And if you look at a lot of their works, they're commanding very, very big numbers in auction. I mean, my research tells me that Ramel Z at the kind of the bottom of that list, as far as auction records, is commanding $240,000, $250,000. And Futura, who's still alive today, who's doing some incredible work and done some incredible collaborations, is commanding in auction 400, 500 and beyond. And it doesn't seem like it's slowing down either. It seems like the trend is growing stronger. How does that make you feel as an artist that seeing your peers command that sort of money? And how would you feel if your works in the future start commanding that sort of work in, in auctions? I congratulate and 
I'm rooting for everyone from our generation because, as you said, there aren't too many left living. And the nature of graffiti and street life, being a kid in New York at that time, it wasn't really conducive to long, successful lives. We burnt out quickly. A lot of guys, drugs, incarceration, violence. So those that are still here, you know, um, Todd James was in one of those uh, fun gallery shows with me. And he was, he was even younger than I am, <laughs> a little kid. I'm talking about 12, 13 years old, right? And he's doing really well now. I wish everyone from my generation were successful. And I feel that um, graffiti art in particular should command those kind of prices and should get um, more uh, serious respect because you know, people try to lump it in with hip hop and make it a sort of a fad thing, right? They use it to sell breakfast cereal or whatever. <laughs> and um, I think a lot of people believed it was a, a phase, a flash in the pen. You know, New York City graffiti movement started the end of the 60s and we're still here and we're still talking about it. And as you mentioned, the prices, the value on auction keeps going up. It doesn't show any sign of uh, being a fad or a phase, you know? And I don't think there's any other art form, genre, or style that's as influential in the world today. Because think about it. You got 12-year-old kids all over the planet now, in Australia, in South Africa, in, 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 in Asia, that are practicing this form. What started in New York City, Philadelphia, LA, and spread, you know, it's now in every nook and cranny of the world. You know, how many kids are practicing uh, cubism right now? So <laughs> to try to downplay this and call it street art, which to me, I don't like that term because anytime you attach street to something, it's generally used to mean if I tell you it's street food, you don't expect to pay Michelin four-star prices, right? If I tell you this is street dance, it's as though I'm looking down my nose at it because it didn't come from the Royal Ballet, right? If I tell you it's a street musician, you don't expect to pay Albert Hall concert prices for him, correct? Mm -hmm. You expect to throw a, a coin at, in his box, if anything, or get it for free. So if somebody tells me I'm a street artist, no. The street is out there. I'm indoors right now, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's used to downplay and to diminish. With graffiti, this form, man, there's a lot that goes into mastery of it. I'm still practicing. I'm still learning. There's mathematics, there's geometry, there's real science to this. And I don't allow anyone to uh, diminish it in front of me. If you tell me, well, this guy fetched 20 million on auction, I'm like, as he should. Why not? Ram LZ, what'd you say? He's getting... To a nearly quarter of a million. Quarter million. He should be getting half a million. He should be getting a million. You know what I mean? Why not? Why is it not um, as serious as, you know, the, the, the Dutch masters or the great oil painters of the past? This is a, a movement that started organically. It wasn't taught in schools. There were no books. Kids in the inner city <laughs> came up with this and developed it and flourished. You know what I mean? And it was passed down from master to apprentice to, you know, till that apprentice begins to take on students. It's like an old world craft. And um, it's every bit as serious. In fact, name another art form where if all the paintbrushes were locked up and you had to steal them and the canvases were put behind fences and you had to climb barbed wire and risk arrest, injury, death, right? How many people would be painting right now? Because that's what graffiti artists do, right? They go to any length to bring their art to the public, painting subway trains illegally. And I don't know if other 
genres of fine art if they would be willing to go to the lengths that we went to to practice our craft. We've mentioned some big names and there's a name that I'm a fan of who's given you a lot of kudos and a lot of respect and he's basically praised you and I know you're a very humble man and you're not the type of guy that wants to be labelled as pioneer and, and all this kind of stuff but to get the recognition from Cause, who is in a documentary that is in the making coming out. Yeah, I think the thing that impresses me most about Keo is just longevity and he's so true to the craft. The work that he makes is authentic, it's him, but to see it over decades and to see his consistency and his dedication to it, you know, in many senses, a lot of graph. You do it for yourself, you do it for your community. And I put Keo amongst that. For the audience's purpose, you know, Cause um, he commands $14 million in auction. So this is a serious guy. How's your relationship? How was that formed with, with Cause? Well, he comes from the same lineage that I come from. So I told you there's masters teaching apprentices, okay? So he's in my school and I just happen to be a little older. So he's always kind of looked up to me stylistically. It's like, if you train uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's Gracie's and then there's, you know what I mean? It, it, it's passed down from one guy to the next. I was fortunate to influence some guys and be able to pass on some of my style to certain guys. And one of the guys who I taught firsthand, my apprentice who became a master himself, he taught cause a lot of things. So in the lineage, I'm like his, his grandfather, you know what I mean? And he's always um, given, given props. He's a very humble guy. So I try to do the same. I don't claim the title of pioneer or, or legend or innovator because there were three generations before me who I learned from. So if I'm a pioneer, what would that make them? I'm just practicing a craft that was passed down and I'm very fortunate that guys took the time to teach me. If I said that I invented this, I would be doing them a disservice. One title that has been given, more so by the people researching you and your market and your history, is they've called you the glue for culture. There's not many who are great at graffiti, now showcasing your first UK debut show in London, former rapper, Scotch, which we're gonna come on to, yeah, I was an MC. And then also a, a designer. And one of my favorite pieces, which we'll get onto when we're doing a short walk and talk, is the piece over here called Doom, which has a mask, which was designed by your good self for your good friend who sadly passed. Yeah, rest Mr. in peace. MF Doom. Would that description kind of resonate with you, the kind of glue between different cultures and different crafts? Again, when I was a kid, we were just having fun and doing what our friends did. So I didn't look at myself as any kind of uh, maverick, but we danced. We used to battle in electric boogie. We used to battle in emceeing. We used to battle in graffiti. I was into skateboarding. You know, whatever it was um, that was going on, I tried it. You know, some things I was better at than others. Now, does that make me some sort of a pioneer? I was just in the right place at the right time. And I consider myself really fortunate to have experienced those things when they were, you know, in the formative years. A lot of youth culture in New York that has since uh, influenced the world. So I got into design, as you mentioned, because a lot of my friends who were MCs, DJs, making music, putting on dance battles or whatever, they would need, first it started with uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts, or they wanted a logo for a flyer. Hey, we're doing a party next week, will you do the flyer? So once some of these guys began to get uh, recording contracts, they would reach out to me to do the record cover or their logo or whatever. It was just a natural progression. And um, I got to design some really iconic uh, album covers and, and logos. 
and apparel stuff with you know streetwear they call it there's that street again right um sportswear you know and to me it's all part and parcel it's not like i did these separate things it's all part of what i did and, and uh, a natural progression to sign painting if my friend opened the shop he'd call me and say hey man can you paint my sign to me that wasn't a departure from this it's just an extension of what we did so that's why i say this is like a craft we never differentiated whatever substrate we would paint on didn't make a difference a truck a bus a wall a train the front of your store your sign your shirt it's just doing what i do again i think that some fine artists if you say well i'm an oil painter on canvas uh they would feel that doing a commercial job might be beneath them or or not in line with what they're doing you know guys like andy warhol guys like keith haring they cross that line all the time they created merchandise t-shirts but you know as well as uh formal paintings they didn't have any problem and that's why you mentioned cause he's super successful because he can design a shoe a toy a clothing line with uniqlo or somebody and no one says oh he sold out or he changed up because that's what you expect from cause it's not a, a deviation or an aberration and i think that's what this particular style of graffiti and that era that you're talking about of the east village artists in the 80s late 70s going into the 80s really began in the 60s it blurred all those lines whether you're a designer graphic artist a commercial artist or a fine artist it's all the same yeah you're an artist or you're not it's yeah. good or it ain't yeah. right to see the gallery not only look the way it is with your wonderful works full of bold bright colors and we'll get onto that as we do a very brief walk around we also had the pleasure of seeing your works up on the front of the building as a light show which i've got to be honest you know we've been in this gallery now for a year i was blown away people outside were blown away i mean people were putting on instagram or all their social media it was crazy and there was a big line of people waiting outside waiting to get in the slightly different element to this show is that we had a partner which is love watts founded by a guy called jordan watts and he was recently on bbc sounds podcast stroke interview talking about you talking about love watts talking about woodbury house talking about the show which was very very good and the amount of people coming here, you know, because they're posting, you know, they've got 2 million followers on Instagram alone. I mean, there's been hundreds of thousands of views on those videos. There's been thousands of likes on your posts, our posts and his posts. I mean, I think it's a testament when you've got good companies, good people together, great things happen off the back end of it. Would you, would you support that? Yeah, 100%. And it ties in with what I was saying about whether it's on a shirt or a sneaker or a canvas, if it's good, it's going to work. So whether it's digital on the internet, it's projected on the side of a building or spray painted on the side of a train, either it works or it doesn't, you know what I mean? And if I say, well, I can't practice my art without the right materials and the right canvas and, and the right studio, then uh, I'm not very good, am I? Because I grew up in a time when we didn't have access to any of that. We didn't have an internet, we didn't have, you know, so, we would steal art supplies. We would, you know, shoplift spray paint and markers. And those were not traditional painting materials. No one had ever used it. Spray paint was for industrial, for auto body or your barbecue grill. So we were the first to apply it to fine art. Now that's a commonplace thing. You know, they sell specialized spray paints for artists and it's in the art supply store. You used to have to go to a hardware store or an auto body store to get these things. If it's good, I should be able to do it in the bush with some berries and rocks or on the latest Macintosh computer and projection. You know, it really doesn't matter the media. And that's why I say it was my generation that helped to kind of blur those lines. Yeah. It's not what you're doing, it's how you're doing. 
That to me is the definition of art. And that comes back to what Keith Haring was able to do really successfully, rest in peace. You know, he had a shop, he had a commercial shop called the Pop Shop. And they sold clothing and all kinds of toys and merchandise and nobody thought twice about it. It fit, it worked. Cause is now able to do that. Reese, Todd James is able to do that. He can design a Nike shoe, put out a, 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 an action figure or a toy and have a gallery showing of, of works on canvas and nobody bats an eye, mm. you know? So that's, that's a good thing. We've broken down some of the barriers, you know? Yeah. Just a quick one. Two of my favorites are behind the X-Men with Storm and then Cyclops. And I think they're great. I think they're powerful, they're large, they're full of energy. To see them on the front of the building, Woodbury House, was kind of mind blowing. Exactly. What was it like for you being the artist creating these works and now they're blown up on, on the front of a Mayfair gallery? Well, the thing about graffiti as I practiced it, you know, the bigger the better, right? So the reason why I did this scale of canvases is because we would spray paint the panel on a subway, meaning between the two doors, the windows, you got a panel. To get any smaller than this, I wouldn't be able to use straight spray paint. I'd have to go into, you know, using airbrush or some other media. So I wanted to keep it authentic. These are all things I could have painted on a train or a wall. So the bigger, the better, right? Instead of the train panel, you want to do a whole car top to bottom or the entire train. That's like the super goal. So to see it projected across like three buildings. Here, <laughs> yeah. Incredible. When I was a kid, there were ways to get your name noticed. You could have the really good style, bright colors, popping, you know, a character that drew attention to your piece, or you could have the biggest, right? Or you could do all of the above. So yeah, to see it projected, it just, it, it belonged there. Yeah. It was as though, you know, I had come and spray painted the whole block in advance of the show. I think you're one of the only few artists that many art critics or so-called experts say that Keo is one of the few that could do this on the streets or could do this on a train or a subway, but actually transfer that onto a canvas. Even some of the greats, which we won't mention, found that there was a struggle doing that transition to the canvas, working into a gallery. So I would like to know a little bit more about that skill as we go around these different works. What I love is the kind of contrast between raw graffiti, original, signs or street panels and then you've got wonderful detailed intricate canvas works and we haven't really seen that within one of our art shows before so why was that important to do some street art panels or signs and then you've got your masterpieces your, your canvas works yeah to me it's all part and parcel so within graffiti um you had the tag right which is a single stroke right and from the tag, it might develop into bubble letters or a throw up and then into block letters and then into wild style. You know, it all goes hand in hand. And these are actual MTA subway panels. So the old trains that we used to paint on, they've been scrapped and taken out of service. So I was able to rescue some parts of the old subway trains. So these are what we actually used to write on. This is, you know, pretty true to what I would have done on the inside of a train car. Whereas something like this would have lived on the outside of the train car. But it's, it all goes hand in hand. Understood. My personal favorites in here, if I could walk away with a few today, it would be Storm X-Men, Cyclops X-Men, this Doom, which is a tribute to MF Doom and his mask. And then clearly this one up here. And I really want to get first hand kind of description from you because for me, this looks like an astronaut being exploded off of Mars or something. Yeah. But the detail, the color, how the colors kind of blend into each other. I mean, that is highly, highly skillful stuff. So because the letter O is just a circle, right? It lends itself to, um, in graffiti, doing something, you know, you get bored of doing the same shape all the time. 
So there's an artist who I really look up to called Knock 167, and he was N-O-C. And his O would always be something different. A diamond, a heart, a star, a face, a character with a hat, right? Or an exploding planet. So when I was a kid, I saw him replace his O with a planet that looked like it was exploding and it blew my mind and left a strong impression. So I wanted to take that basic concept, which other graffiti writers have played with of an exploding world and take it to the next level where it's actually blowing someone away, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's as though, you know, my name is so uh, explosive that it, it'll blow you away. Yeah, it's only when you're up and close and personal, you see the greens, you see the blues, you see the reds, you see the oranges, and it's perfect how it's all rendered onto that canvas. I think it's a really, really detailed and, and phenomenal work. Over here is a little bit different, right? You know, um, we spoke about the top lady there with the pearl necklace and mm -hmm. exposed uh, chest. And then we also have another wonderful work below it. Could you quickly tell us a bit more about these particular works? So. Again, my O has been replaced. Instead of a, a simple, you know, circle, boring O, I've taken the opportunity to put a, a, a beautiful woman, and she's kind of like a Moulin Rouge or a, a dancer, a, you know, a, a burlesque performer. She has that uh, sort of showgirl mm -hmm. look to her, you know? And in this one, I've replaced the O with a heart, right? and the heart is being fired from some sort of a cannon. And you know, it's a little more abstract, but um, it's just having fun with it, man. You know, if I sit here and tell you there's something really deep and, and philosophical behind it, I'd be lying to you. I'm just having a ball. I'm painting what I love. And um, if you're looking for deep psychological meaning, okay, if you see this and, and that's what you get out of it, great. Me. I'm just trying to keep it fun and exciting. And these are things I would have done, you know, as a kid when I was writing graffiti. I, I would always replace my O with something. Might be a character, might be a, a heart, might be a beautiful woman, you know, a face, a bomb, an eight ball, right? So it just, how many ways can you flip a letter? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, these are definitely fun. The images, the colors, the feeling, I think they're very, very cool. But talking about a deeper meaning, I really feel that you're probably gonna say that this particular work, which is one of my favorites, probably has more of a deeper meaning than maybe these, because it is linked to the MF Doom. So there was a box set of Doom's music that we worked on where I did an illustration this same image, smaller, was on the back of a box set of music, the packaging. I liked the image so much that once I had the opportunity to paint larger, I said, I'm, I'm gonna reproduce it. And it's a lyric, yo, yo, you can't stand right here, right? In this right hand is your man's worst nightmare. Loud enough to burst his right eardrum at close range. The game is not only dangerous, but it's most strange. Right? So that's just Doom lyrics. And this was actually, um, yeah, this was a, an illustration that I used in, in his packaging design. And it's the mask, which uh, he wore. It weighed about seven pounds of, of, of steel. It was a, a serious piece of armor. Again, kind of like the, the planet that you like so much, it's, it's sort of exploding, you know? I try to get a sense of even though you're working flat and spray paint is a very flat medium, I try to get some depth as though things are popping out at you or whatever. Create some uh, dynamic movement. You know, we talked about boxing earlier. So in my gym, they call me Abuelito Explosivo, which means the explosive grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. I see here as well, uh, Keo. I like this work because oh, yeah. it's, cause it's yeah, fun. Yeah. I've got two young boys. It always kind of reminds me of something they would like because it's fun and it's 
animation, etc. So this is inspired by Von Baudet. Okay. He had a little character called Peeper, which when I was a kid, Von Baudet's comic strips would be found in pornography magazines or underground uh, comics like heavy metal that were very hard for us to come by. So they looked like, like you said, childlike drawings, very um, cartoony, kid friendly, but there were some serious themes going on, you know, adult situations. So we used to seek out these magazines. You, there was one place in Manhattan that carried them and we would go and we'd try to shoplift them, you know, and if you got one, you'd share it with all your friends and we'd all copy the characters. And it was used in a lot of graffiti. So that's definitely a Von Baudet inspired guy. And his name is Peeper. Yeah, it's incredible. So again, this is a section of a piece, right? So you'd have K, E, and he might serve as the O. Yeah. And um, that one is on sheet metal. I like it a lot. I like it. And it's one of the few works that actually got a feature on the front of the gallery in the light show, which is really, really cool. And then we've got some of these other works here. Talk to me about all of these works, because these are kind of bold, kind of fun. And then you've also got these original uh, underground. Well, again, panels. interior of the train, exterior of the train, right? So this kind of a piece, you see how it has a flat bottom to it that would sit on the base of the train, the windows above, your character K-E-O, right? That's how I would treat the exterior of a train car. Then I would move to the interior, and these are panels that held uh, advertisements or subway maps, and somebody, you know, the commuters would sit right here, and that would be behind them. Certain panels you would approach differently because they had different available spaces, right? And these are actual um, advertisements that, that rolled in the subway train and this one again this is like exterior spray painting and this is interior we would use markers and ink so this one is really um historic to me because again these trains have been scrapped they don't exist anymore these were the last of the old fleet and this one actually ran during the covid19 uh lockdown the pandemic exactly so this, you know, I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back at this as a really uh, strange and historic time in, in our history. So I was fortunate to find this. You know, the funny thing, when I was writing graffiti on the trains in the 80s, they might have had an ad like this said, stop the spread, wear a condom. Same thing, public service announcement about HIV, right? So now it's, it's about... Um, COVID-19. What's the next one? <laughs> Who knows? Hopefully there isn't going to be a next one, but well, history yeah. always tells us there is always a next one. Certainly. And also, just quickly, the colour. Mm. I know from previous conversations that this particular colour features in a lot of your major works, whether it's the big canvas works or whether it's these smaller kind of panels. Why is this colour so important to you? So this sort of magenta, and you'll see it here, right? You'll see a, even a few dots of it, but it, it always, and, and this, this poster actually had it without me adding it. So that color right here, you'll see the beam from Cyclops's eyes and, and the polka dots within the piece, that same sort of magenta. This was a very desirable and hard to find spray paint color when I was a kid. There weren't as many colors available as there are now and most stores, they would stock the basic and boring colors, right? Hunter green, navy blue, battleship gray, black, white, silver. Those, those you could find anywhere. We had a color we call hot raspberry from Krylon. To have that color in your arsenal guaranteed that your piece was gonna burn everyone else. You know what I mean? The availability of, of certain colors made them really, really desirable to us. So I still use that as a sort of a motif throughout all my work. If you look at Karnak K in the back room, but he's outlined in that color, the K. It was like sneakers, right? You might have dunks in gray and white, red and white, blue and white, everybody's got them. 
But if you found lavender, whoa, where'd you get those? So it was a similar thing within our, our painting. If you had certain colors, you were kind of stand out from the crowd. Everybody didn't have access to that. Tell me about the reference to X-Men. I've watched X-Men as, uh, as a kid. My son, one of my sons is called Logan, and that is the name of Wolverine. Sure. So I've got an alliance with X-Men, but probably in a different way. Well, What's the meaning behind it? Um, for me, my first exposure to uh, X-Men as a kid, my, my older brother was very into Marvel Comics. So we're talking about the original, you know, Jack Kirby, the, the first generation of X-Men comics. I would look at my brother's stuff and he'd be like, don't bend it, don't, you know, I had to be careful with these things. And that's where I got a lot of inspiration from. But in 1979, a couple friends of mine started a graffiti crew called the X-Men. And that was a kind of an unusual name for a graffiti crew. Most of them had three letters like, you know, TPC, the people's choice, some kind of, you know, um, TMB, the master blasters, the mad bombers. That was a normal graffiti crew. To call it X-Men, we based that on an older crew from Brooklyn called the X-Vandals which stood for the experienced vandals, right? So we really liked how they did their thing because they didn't focus on their own personal names. They, they promoted the crew first. So you would see tags said X vandals, really old. I'm talking 1972, 73, 74. And they used a very intricate style, X vandals. And then if they had time, they might put their name next to it. You know, WG or Dino Nod or those tags influenced our crew. And we were the next generation, right? 79, 80, 81, till about 85, 86. And then I quit um, riding on trains. And, you know, I left it alone for a long time. But that was the heyday of the X-Men crew. And we modeled ourselves after the X-Vandals crew. And we tried to put up the name of the crew before our own personal names. Yeah. Which is unusual in, in, in graffiti, which is kind of a, a, an egotistical sport. It's not so much of a team sport, you know? Yeah. So we really worked as a unit yeah. to spread the name of the crew. And I think we, we were pretty successful at it. A lot of um, a lot of folks from New York in that era remember fondly what the X Men crew did, and we still do. And it's now that crew is spread all over the world. I got members in Argentina. I got members in Johannesburg. I got members right here. So, you know, it, um, and and Japan, and yeah. It, it's pretty much uh, become a worldwide phenomenon. So I was real fortunate to be one of the original members. First, first generation of X-Men. It's very cool. And it's a bit like the X-Men army, right? And even looking at these images, they're very like the retro version, which I really, really enjoy. And lastly, Keo, if we go to the bar area and look at just these last paintings, I really like this one here. I mean, you know, look, it's again, a subway sign. This very, is the destination very cool. sign. Yeah. So um, the K train is rare. That's that's not a line that, uh, you know, a lot of people ride. So <laughs> that that's my initial. OK, you know, Keo. Yeah. I and it's it simplistic, cool. you know, just with the tag, yeah. with that wonderful uh, frame and, and glass over it. I think it really, really, yeah, really it, makes it a really good piece of art to hang in your home. Any, any more would be too much. It's like elegant, yeah. it's simple, uh, you know, it, and it's true to what we used to do. This, this one, same thing. Yeah. That's exactly how I would have tagged on one of those signs back in the days. So, and we've got this, uh, this other work here. So I, I've seen a few of your works with military, either soldiers or gangsters or mobsters, or maybe the authorities with their guns. And they look like they're in a bit of commotion. Sure. What's that? What's that expressing? 
Well, this is definitely um, Jack Kirby influenced and a nod to the great King Kirby. But when we were kids, it seemed like the cops, and this is a, you know, a, a plain clothes man and, and two uh, uniformed cops, they were sort of the uh, opposition or the, the, the rivals. So we, we felt they were always chasing us, you know what I mean? So it's as though these guys have been flustered. They, they arrived just a minute too late. And my piece is already there. And, you know, they burst out the window and hey, I'm, I'm already gone. Yeah. So they look a little upset, hoping to catch me in the act. The work over here, which I find a, a lot more simplistic to some of the others, actually does remind me in my heart of hearts, a slight connection to Cause for some reason. Maybe because of the eye and the stuff that he does like, like that. Um, I don't know whether you ever subconsciously there was that influence there or there's another meaning behind this. Well, Maybe because he uh, bases some of his characters on animation art, whether it be, you know, The Simpsons or, or The Smurfs or, you know. Yeah. So this guy right here is based on um, a famous character from the Warner Brothers cartoons, which was called Marvin the Martian. And he's just a little guy with a, his, his head looks like an eight ball, but I've put him in into a different uniform and world here. He's no longer a Martian. It speaks to me being a, a you know, a little wide-eyed kid looking yeah. at this graffiti yeah, yeah. and feeling like, you know, sometimes you'd be wandering through hostile city. I felt very alone sometimes and frightened as a little kid. And then you come across this brightly colored graffiti and it kind of, um, it was comforting almost, you know, made me feel like, uh, some other kids had been here and, and done something beautiful in this ugly environment, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that guy is sort of me looking at, at, at a piece of graffiti when I was a kid, sort of wide-eyed, uh, you know. I really feel like these two pieces are almost connected, you know, in some ways. Well, they both have the desert uh, mesa scene, but this is, you also got a planet here. This is more um, otherworldly. You've got that pink, you know, that red in there, which is uh, magenta, yeah, is the outline on the planet. I s tried to sneak a little bit into every piece. Yeah. And lastly, I really like this work. Am I right in saying that this is one of the designs for MF Doom's cover? So I did the original cover for Operation Doomsday. There were several different iterations, and this was to be the latest repressing. It's, it's like variant covers, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Basically a remix of that. So I submitted this for the new vinyl double LP reissue of Operation Doomsday by MF Doom, rest in peace. And, you know, I don't know if this will be the one, the final image they wind up using or we go another direction, but that's what it was created for. And this is actually one of the oldest pieces in this show because I did this before I started the large paintings. And it's unique from the rest of them in that it's not 100% spray paint. There's brushwork. This has mixed media. If you look up the original cover for, you know, Operation Doomsday, you'll see that it has a similar style, but it's more flat. So I tried to just pop this one out. Yeah, that one looks a little more, uh, what do you call that, lo-fi, sort of a, a analog, analog version. You know, we had been doing this from kids. It was natural to us. And then somebody said, oh, I want you to do it on a canvas and hang it in my gallery. And all of a sudden it was unnatural. And we thought we had to change it up. We became self-conscious. I suffered this for a lot of years. I thought in order to show a painting in a fine art setting, in a gallery, that somehow my graffiti wasn't enough. I had to change it up to fit what my idea of fine art was. It took me a long time to realize not. They were interested in what we were doing. They invited us to galleries. They wanted to show our work. They wanted to sell our work commercially because it was so dynamic and raw and energetic. 
They didn't want us to change it up to what we, we believed they wanted to see. So if I'm always chasing what I think the viewer wants to see or the collector or the art buyer, I'm lost. So I just do what makes me happy and I hope it comes through. There's a lot of joy in these things. There's a lot of pleasure in these things. I have a ball painting them. It's the same shit I loved when I was a kid. I'm fortunate to still be doing it now. If somebody else sees it and they feel some of that same passion and joy, great. If they don't get it at all, oh well. I'm not gonna change to try to fit what you like and then I gotta switch it up for what he likes and you know what I mean? You're lost the minute you try to chase that. Why would I abandon what made me famous in the first place, right? This is what people know me for. This is what they expect from Keo. Keo, it's been an absolute pleasure homing you here in London Mayfair and we're hoping a part two in the future. Yeah, man, it's, it's uh, an honor and a privilege. I'm super grateful to be here and um, I'll be back soon. You know, um, this is my third time in London and it won't be my last. So yeah, look for more big things from uh, Love Watts and Woodbury House. And uh, yeah, coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> Peace.